Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk with professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their lives in and outside of the ring, as well as doing acts of charity, community service, volunteering, and just spreading positivity. You know, we're all about the positive vibes here on the show. And I've got a very special guest with me. He has worked in a variety of different roles in the wrestling business. I'm talking about wrestler, commentator, announcer, promoter, you name it. He has probably done it. One form of one form or another. Pleased to welcome to the show, John Bullard. Welcome, John, to Wrestling with Heart. Dan, the man, thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, love what you're doing, and, and it's an honor to be on the show tonight with you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So let's talk about your upbringing and childhood. You're from the Midwest area, Indiana. Tell me about your upbringing and childhood. Well, uh, originally, actually, I was born and raised down south. Uh, I grew up in South Florida for most of my life. But okay. uh, as a child growing up, you know, a typical country kid, uh, grew up in the uh, the farming area. So, you know, you go to school Monday through Friday. Then uh, Saturday mornings, it's the world of cartoons. And then this magical thing called professional wrestling comes on television and changed my entire life at four years old. So wow. uh, first memory of professional wrestling, uh, four years old, uh, was sitting in my Papa Sam's lap uh, watching WTBS 605 Eastern Time. You know, like most Southern Southern kids, uh, you know, NWA, WCW, uh, that was that was a life changing moment uh, for my my time growing up, you know, but I've, I've also had like some other great memories, too. But, you know, uh, I came from a very uh, blue collar family uh, raised by a, a single parent who instilled a strong work ethic and and the uh, belief of the golden rules. You know, you treat everyone with respect and be kind to everyone and never try and take away from someone always trying to bring back and give back to your community and the people around you yeah. so i was very blessed with that uh, type of life and and type of people i had in my life and that's what we try to do on the show is just is is talk about the kind things that wrestlers and people that are in the business do and just inspire someone, whether that's a fan or somebody that just happens to stumble across the podcast and wants to check us out. So you've had you've had an amazing career, an amazing life, got into wrestling at four years old. I mean, I got into wrestling when I was five. So it's right around the same, you know, kind of age time frame. I tell you what was the life changing moment for me, though, Stan, was uh, when satellite television came into the area when I was growing up and instantly as a kid, I went from watching just the local cable, like local TV syndicate shows, mm -hmm. but also got to see like uh, Memphis TV, uh, Lance Russell, you know, uh, I got to watch Texas wrestling. Uh, then one night I went through a channel that spoke a language I didn't understand. And I got the chance to watch uh, CMLL and, and triple R uh and and got introduced at a very young age to lucha libre and to me that was so mind-blowing because like here's all these guys who are looking like superheroes doing really cool things and just blew my young mind because i was like i'm watching something so different and yeah just satellite cable for a kid who grew up in a town that was that was the area i grew up in probably about 1500 people in general so a very small town so if you didn't have a whole lot of kids in your neighborhood, your imagination and television and books was like the the escape to to see what another world looks like. Yeah, like you were living in a part of the area where you were just right on the border of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And just seeing like a different culture, being exposed to that, that is life changing. And you see that the Lucha style is being integrated now into American wrestling culture. It's just mind-blowing how over time you just see the progression of of wrestling evolve. Absolutely. Wrestling, you know, growing up as a kid from the who watched wrestling in the 1980s, 
and watching through the 90s and 2000s, I'll definitely say over the years how much the evolution of wrestling has changed. You know, it used to be back in the 1980s, no one never left their feet. And then the 90s, you're starting to see a little bit more than get to the late, I'll say like late 90s, early 2000s, you're starting to see more of the Japanese, a lot more of the, the Lucha Libre inspired uh, wrestling skills uh, being put to the test. Now everyone, uh, no matter what size they are, has those skills. I'm happy and I'm proud that YouTube's available because like now, like all the kids I talk to that I mentor in wrestling, it's like, okay, you should go back and, and you see that move you're doing there. Yeah. Well, you know, Brian Daniels, you know, Brian Danielson does it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Brian Daniels, Danielson got that from Tiger Mask or he got that from Dynamite Kid. Watch, go back and watch your stuff in the eighties, 20 years ahead of its time. Yeah. I mean, that's stuff that, you're influenced by you get hooked on and then like you know you kind of have to watch back and and look back and go okay this is this makes sense because when you see a guy like brian danielson uh pull those moves off he studied tape he's watching tape and so you kind of have to pay respect to the people that came before you and you see that in the you know on those tapes Watch oh, yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely tell different wrestlers uh who are their influences or, or lineage came from, you know, certain talents that they study and, and learn from. Mm-hmm. Uh with Davidson, of course, William Regal, you know, was a mentor of his, but Regal also got that lineage from Marty Jones. Marty Jones got that from Billy Robson. Billy Robson British. from from Riley, yeah. from Riley um, where where Robson was trained at. You know, same thing with Carl Gotch and and so forth and so on. So yeah, wrestling is a beautiful thing. Once once people start doing like the whole lineage tracing of who they came yeah. from and who trained who and who trained what, it's, it's like wow, it's amazing how that that follows. And and you know, it just goes to show you that American wrestling is largely influenced by the stuff that happens overseas, like the Japanese style, the lucha style, the British style. I mean. Those are the pioneers, the true pioneers of the sport. And you see today it's influence. It's it's fascinating the way you just just described it because nowadays uh, everything's all one big melting pot. You see it and it's, it's incredible. It really is. But speaking about mentors, who are your mentors starting out in the business? So uh, Spike Moore uh, was one of my first mentors in wrestling. He was a a regional wrestler trained at the WCW Power Plant. Uh, to kind of give you a little backstory about how I got in wrestling, that to me yeah. is, is yeah. one of those stories I, I like telling people because it kind of inspires yeah. people. So eighth grade year, uh, I'm sitting in a, a place called a Business Tech Lab class. And my school teacher at the time, Miss Leak, asked all the students, what do you want to do when you get older and you want to become the adult and what, what's your plans? And everybody was wanting to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, and she came to me and I said, well, I want to be in professional wrestling. And I never forgot this. She laughed and she said, well, that's cute. That's a pipe dream. Now get, get with reality. And I never forgot that as a kid because she was like my favorite teacher at the time. So as a kid, like I was devastated by this. Now from eighth grade all the way up to 11th grade, I never talked about it again. So he's huge wrestling fan. Still studied it. Did all the go out in the backyard with my buddies and grapple and wrestle around like kids all did back in the nineties. But I, I never I never talked to another adult about what I wanted to do. Well, eleventh grade year, English class one oh one. Had a PWI magazine tucked inside my English book. Already finished my class. I was ahead of the schedule, you know, thinking I was being smart. I had a teacher named Miss Diane Shruby. It was a, a blessing in this world. She comes walking up behind me. And she sees that PWI magazine. Now, instead of yanking the magazine away from me, she goes, wow, who was number one for this year? And instantly, I kind of panicked. I was like, hold up. She knows what the PWI is. Like, this is kind of cool. Like, all right. And I was like, and I looked up and I was like, oh, you know, and I kind of gave her the answer. And she's like, oh, that's really amazing. You know, my son's a professional wrestler. And instantly, I was like, this is the coolest teacher on earth. She was a nice. friend. Of my, she was a friend of my family's for years, but I, I never knew her son did professional wrestling. Always knew her son was a ginormous guy. So, 
at the end of the class, I was like, your son's a professional wrestler, the, the one that I know? And she's like, yeah, you didn't know this? I'm like, no. I always thought, like, how cool he was, but I never knew, like, that's what he did. And she's like, yeah, he's Big Daddy Rhodes, and he wrestles on the local independent scene in Florida. I was like, that's so cool. I was like, and this this fell out of my mouth, kind of like that scene in uh, The Christmas Story when he's moving the hubcap and it popped down. You're like, oh, you know, same thing for me. I'm like, wrestling. And she's like, so you want to be in wrestling? I was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, gosh, she's going to make fun of me. And she's like, you know, and then and she said the one thing that changed my life, and I use this with every kid I meet, is you can do what you want to do in your life if you have the heart determination and you have the willpower to not give up when going gets tough. Now, this is a tough business. This is a business that at times can be very unforgiving. But if you stick it out, you can make it happen. But you just, you got you to gotta roll up your sleeves and put in the work. The best advice to me. Second thing she did for me. I got tickets to the next wrestling show coming to the area. You got free tickets. Come to the show. I'll introduce you to... My son, and also to Spike, who helps run the little local wrestling school. Sure enough, go there, talk to him. Next thing I was on mask is, hey, uh, so you want to be a wrestler, huh? I was like, yeah. They kind of gave me the tryouts and the, the dates. And they asked me the biggest question. How old are you, kid? And then so I was like, oh. And I was like, oh, too young. I know that. So I was like, well, you know, I'm only... I'm only 17. They're like, well, that's, that's okay. You know, we can still teach you some stuff, but you're not going to, you're not going to get in the ring instantly and then bump around or nothing like that. You gotta, you gotta start paying your dues. So every show, I'm go to the building, set up, take down, clean up, do everything they ask. Never even ask a question why. It was, yes, sir, let's do this. And so I remember times that he would hand me a huge sack of flyers. Go around town, go to every telephone post you see, put the flyer up. Get on my bike, ride through, post them up. And one night, uh, I get a phone call. Hey, uh, you got a suit and tie uh, available? Now, this is the weirdest question I heard at that, that age. I'm like, yeah, I got a, a suit for, for Sunday, for church. Why? Good. Bring it with you. Okay. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, why is he asking this? So, wear my suit, go to the show. Well, found out that their ring announcer and commentator, who always was at every show, didn't make it that night. So, here I was, young me, making my debut in that, that film. And so, that was the beginning of me getting my foot in the door in wrestling business. And uh, from 17... All the way up now until I'm age, uh, I hate age myself. I'm 40 years old now, but it's it's been this wonderful journey. So, yeah, uh, Spike Moore definitely is a, a mentor. Um, I haven't talked to him in a long time. I need to reach out to him and and see how he's doing. I know he's last time I heard he's living in Phoenix, Arizona, hmm. but him, yeah. um, uh, Mickey Grant, uh, who helped create World Class Championship Wrestling, uh, taught me a lot about filmmaking and production of wrestling. Uh, when it comes to that, uh, Brutal Bob Evans, which a lot of people in wrestling world talks about, is someone who I consider uh, a tremendous mentor to me. And I've also had other mentors, um, the Lone Wolf Bobby Blade, a uh, veteran of Kentucky wrestling. He was one of the guys that anytime I had a question or uh, anytime I had self-doubt, he was one of the first guys like, you got this. Like, don't don't quit. Don't give up. Don't let, don't let naysayers get to you. You're going to do fine. And yeah, those guys, I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to as well for, for spending time with a kid that honestly they didn't have to spend time with. They didn't have to take five minutes out of their day to talk to me or um, just to drop knowledge, but they did it. And I learned from them, if you find someone who's hungry, someone who wants to learn, someone who's eager to do well, you teach them. And you, you do it well for them. And you don't ask for anything in return just to pass that knowledge. So the day that you're not there, then you got someone there to carry on your legacy. Wow, what a great story. I mean, you're basically telling me that there was a time when there was a one teacher you had just 
hated power, the idea. Power of one person. All it is, one person can change your life. I tell this to people all the time. It, people say, well, one person can't make a difference. One person can change someone's life. One person, one simple hello, one simple hug, one simple how you do can save a person's life. You have a story you wanted to share with me about some things that I know you went through uh, in your life. It, yeah, yeah. Not afraid to not afraid to talk about it. Uh, yeah, tell me about that. 2010. Uh, you're talking about my uh, attempt on my life that I fell, which is I always tell people this uh, when I do uh, group speeches to kids. Uh, it's it's uh, what I call my greatest failure became my greatest strength and my greatest victory in the end. Uh, 2010 was probably the worst year of my life. Uh, my father, the only person I've ever really known as a kid growing up, because I didn't really know my mom. Uh, he's He had a long battle with stage four cancer. So watching him go through those battles, watching him go through chemotherapy, watching him go through all those struggles, and then losing him on December 5th was just so much heartbreak. And then going through losing him on December 5th to going uh, out of town to take care of stuff for his, his burial costs and then coming back and seeing my house got broken into and everything stolen. And just, I mean, when I mean stolen, I mean everything was stolen. That left me with a whole burden on my, my heart at the time. I was thinking, like, I got nothing. You no, know, and my family photos were taken. Like, everything was gone. Mm-hmm. So I was very young at that time. And uh yeah, I went through went through a really dark spell. Uh December tenth. Uh I I made a decision that I was going to commit suicide. And I tell people like when you talk about the divine intervention in life, sometimes you're you're thinking it's gonna be that time and then it's not. Uh I I always tell people this. Uh went down to the riverbank uh where my house was at and uh wrote a letter and took a gun that i have fired a hundred times never jammed up not once cleaned it wrote the letter out put in the message went in put the gun in my mouth pulled the trigger one of the only few people to say did it pulled the trigger gun jammed a um... gun that never jammed not one day in my life not once now when this happened i i ain't gonna lie i broke down because i was thinking to myself like lost my father lost everything i've ever owned and i i couldn't even do this i just beyond devastated get up was decided i want to go probably walk walk back up to the house don't know what i want to do but i was in the middle state of I tried and I fell. Well, while walking across, a co-worker of mine, it's my good friend Randy Nance, always wants to get power one person. Um, this probably would be like my, my definition of this entire interview, how one person changes lives. Uh, Randy Nance was a was probably one of the coolest friends I've ever had in my life, great co-worker. Comes driving up, sees me walking across the road. Randy knows I never walk anywhere, I always drive. He stops his truck. He pulls and he reverses right back. He's like, "Get in the truck." I was like, "Okay," you know. And I don't know why. I don't, I don't think he knows what was going on, and I didn't. I'm trying to let on. He's like, "Get in the truck, man." And I was like, "Okay." I'm jumping the truck with. Him. He's like, "We're just going to ride around the stock." So okay, we're right around. We start talking. Randy was like, "You just lost your dad, didn't you?" I was like, "Yeah," because at that time when we worked together, I took FMLA. I uh, was like full medical leave of absence, I, I had to take care of my dad. And I was like, yeah, I lost him uh, five days ago. And he was like, well, there's something that you, there's few things that you need to do before you you figure out what you're going to do with your life. And he's like, now that you have this freedom, now that you, you've lost him, he would probably want you to go try to live your life, but he would probably want you to also try to discover your happiness again. He's like, you've had all that mournfulness. You had all this heartbreak. You literally watched him crumble in front of you. He's like, you need to give yourself some time to grieve, but you also need to give yourself time to actually start enjoying life again. 
and finding reasons. He gives me this great advice. This is the same advice I give to everyone I talk to go through depression. Get yourself a notebook. Every day, find one reason to live. Find one thing. It doesn't have to be, uh, today I'll lift uh, 500 pounds. It could be like, today I'll watch the sunrise. Or today I see birds chirp. Or I see, uh, I, I heard a baby laugh. With, with bouncing on the lap of a mother. Little things. Watching a flower bloom. Little things that you can actually appreciate. He, he said it the best. He said that the beauty is simplicity. He said, if you give simplicity a chance, the world's beautiful as that. More beautiful than a band. I was like, wow. And it hit me. I was like, I never thought of any of this stuff. Because at that time, I was drinking myself. I was just in a dark place. He said, now I want you to do another thing. He said, now you're outside of this notebook. He said, I want you to buy a map. And he said, make it a world map if you want. Or a map of the United States. Doesn't matter. Just have a map. Then I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a dart. Wherever that dart lands, go visit that location. So I did that numerous times. And every time, I would, I would always land someplace I'd never been to before. So I would go on these road trips. And I would go and, and sometimes... Uh, not no, not one soul in that area, not one soul in that state. Or, and there's been a few that I've been to a couple of other countries that I've never thought I would ever go to. But it's the best experience because I got to meet people from all walks of life. I got to see, um, I got to see the beauty of human kindness from many, but I also got to see what real suffering was as well too, which is eye opening because when you feel that you have suffered. Fall like fails in such comparison when you see someone who's been through it ten times worse, and yet that person is still standing. And you have to ask yourself, like, if they can go through this, then I have no excuse not to keep going myself. Life changing. Those moments in life changes your perspectives, it really does. So once again, power of one person. It took one person seeing something that they knew that was mm, didn't look right. I'm going to stop and talk to him. And he did. Uh, years later, I told that to Randy. I was like, I don't know if you knew this or not. I was like, you saved my life. And he's like, I kind of figured. He kind of knew like something was up. He's like, kind of figured he was going through a dark place, but you need someone to reach out to and talk to. So in return, I've I've paid the favor over to, to numerous other people as well over the years because I felt like, you know what, pay it forward. You know, and uh, one of the things I try to do is uh, a lot of youth outreach. I'll try to always talk to young kids that I know I can see they're kind of going down a dark path. They're kind of going down uh, the wrong route in life. Um, when I see someone on Facebook or social media kind of going, they kind of make those not so like out in the open posts about their depression, but someone who survived through it, you can, you can see the subtle things. You're like, yeah, you're, you're about to, you're about to end your life. If I, if, if I don't, reach out and say something to you right now i would regret this and so yeah i try to do my best to always reach out to people and i tell people all the time too uh if you're going through a dark place in life and i don't care if you don't know me reach out to me i'll listen to you no I'll, I'll do my best to help you out as you said it all it takes is just one person uh and it really it's it's interesting because seeing different cultures, meeting different people, seeing how other people live their lives, and you look at your life, it just oh, yeah. provides a different experience. And when you're going to these different places, what's the one thing that you can say that you enjoyed the most when you visited? For me, not really knowing someone but yet yeah, that person was willing to break bread and share a meal or uh, share their experiences. India was like that for me, you know, uh, being a guy that wasn't Indian and getting to meet people from that country and meeting the different uh, caste system uh, levels, you would have to say. Uh, there's times you see people who were the, the poorest of the poor. And yet they found happiness in the simplicity of things. 
uh, seeing mystics on the uh, the rivers. You know, these elderly old men who have lived for almost a hundred years, part wisdom, just to sit next to them and listen to the water and then just listen to them talk. Uh, getting to meet uh, the wrestlers of the uh, the Akaras, you know, the, their training facilities they have in India, just to see that and, and the dedication of, of uh, strength building, but also it's almost like a religious thing with them too. Sure. Um, so little things like that was really cool. Uh, the thing is too, and, and don't sound preach or nothing, but I noticed that a lot of people that are very wealthy never seem happy. But yet I've seen people who have almost no wealth at all be more happier than someone who has all the money in the world. It's wild to think about that. Wild concept at times. But the simplicity, just a little simple living, you know, can really change um, really change a man's outlook on life. And it seems like the older you get, the more things you were worried about at 20 you may not be something to really think about when you're 40. Uh, exactly. and onwards. And, you know, I, I gotta say, like, I'm very sorry that you had to go through such a horrific and tragic experience. Don't be. don't be, don't ever apologize for that. I don't, I don't feel sorry for it. Honestly, I'm glad it happened, uh, that I went through that, that attempt. I'm glad that I went through, uh, those battles because if I didn't, I don't think I would be the person today that I am that tries to help others. Sometimes you have to go through suffering to appreciate the beauty of things. There's times that, I guess the best way I've explained it is, if you have never had a rainy day, if you never had dark clouds over you and you always had sunshine, would you really actually appreciate the sunshine? If it's always there? Yeah, sometimes you have to go through some dark periods to get to the get to the light. The but I mean, you appreciate it though. That light, when you finally get to it, the appreciation is a ten times stronger than what it was if you never understood what struggles were. But I mean, losing all your your belongings and property, and that's just horrifying. And then on top of that, you have a death in the family. I mean, that's just that's scary. Oh yeah, it is. But this is also how I see it too. I. uh I learned that in though how much I, I can miss those valuables, I've replaced it and returned it with better memories and new memories in life and things that I have organically was blessed with that no one can take away from me. So once you have that strength, now sometimes you got to let the past go and that's another thing I, I, I try to teach my, my students and, and people when I talk to them is the art of letting go. And sometimes letting go of things gives you more strength and, and, and more balance than anything else. It's all about the passage of time. And the older you get, the more stuff you lose, but you also gain some things as well. You gain perspective of the world around you. You start reading up on things, studying up on things that you didn't really think was, you know, you knew before. Not, you know, and so all you can do is just look forward. John, I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. It means a lot to me and to my listeners and viewers watching this on YouTube. Where can people find more about you on social media? Well, they could definitely uh, find me on Instagram, uh, Big Fight Bullard on Instagram. That is one of my uh, main accounts, uh, John Bullard uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can't miss me. Uh, just you see a picture of me, and then you definitely know it's me. Um, that's my main two things. I also have uh, a YouTube channel as well. I'll send you uh, a link to it. Yes, please. I mean, we'll subscribe. Well, both of us will subscribe to each other's channels. We'll love to. We'd love to, Stan. Um, but yeah, just that's and Facebook's my main way for anybody to reach out to me. If anybody wants to reach out and uh, want to talk bookings, I'll be glad to. But also, if you just want to reach out and say, hey, uh, I need advice on something, or uh, it, I also hope this video saves someone's life or this video inspires someone to chase after their dream. Because take it from the kid who grew up in a small town that came from a single parent home, didn't come from wealth by no means. 
and was told by a school teacher that their dream was a little silly. But all it took was another teacher to say, your dream could become a reality if you work at it. It could happen. You just got to put in the work. I like to hear that. John, thank you so much, and you're more than welcome to come back. Stan, it'd be an honor. All right. Take care. You too. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.